yeah, and you, and the, and you, yes. No idea that it even existed, and then I saw it in the kettle. I want that. Because, of course, those catalogs are designed to make us want the things in the catalog. Just like the commercials are all designed to make us want the thing in the commercial. And sometimes I got the things that I wished for, but I also often got the things that I needed. Some of us might have grown up mostly getting the things we needed and a few of the things that we wished for. But I've noticed that when I was a kid, as I would flip through that catalog and wish for those things, I was just imagining how much fun they would be. I could imagine if I just had, think of all the good times I would have if I just had this, Flash Gordon whatever, or whatever, 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 I was entertained for years, probably. I would never get tired of this toy. I could imagine a perfect world that would exist when I would have all those toys that I desired. And they didn't always materialize. Because imagining and wishing, of course, don't make it happen. Our world is a mess. I don't have to tell you that. You know that. We watch the news, we read what's happening in our world, we look around and we see that our world is a mess. And nobody wants it to be this way. None of us are thinking, oh, it's so great that there are folks right now outside when it's cold and wet and windy. We think, I wish it wasn't like this. None of us think, I'm so glad that there are wars happening in parts of the world. We wish it were different. None of us are thinking, oh, thank God that there are so many children in foster care who've been there for years. We want it to be different. Oh, thank God that so many people struggle to make ends meet from week to week, from day to day. We imagine a world where it is different. But if we're honest, most of the time, as we imagine a world that is different than it is, it's not that different than flipping through the catalog when we were kids and seeing things that we wish were true or we wish we had but that we had no real ability to make real. We flip through that catalog and we imagine all the world, the world as it could be, and we circle, oh, I wish there were houses for everybody. Dog ear that page. I wish everybody had enough food to eat. I'm going to dog ear that page too. I wish there was no more war. I'm going to big circle on that one. But wishing for something is not the same as hoping for something. Our world is a mess. Our lives can be a bit of a mess. And even if our lives are mostly pretty smooth and easy, we do wish that we were different. I wish I were different. I wish I were more loving and gentle. I wish I were more patient. I wish that I was better at praying. I wish I could just be so centered and grounded in the presence of God and the holiness of every moment that I just glowed with holiness. 
I wish that when I saw someone standing on the corner asking for help, for food, or for a bus ticket, that there wasn't a cynical voice inside my head that said they could probably get a job. I wish that when I read the stories of the, that happened in the news around the world, I didn't think there's really nothing I can do about that. I wish that my life were a little bit different than it is, that I was a different person than I seem to be in my day-to-day living. And it's not that my life is terrible. My life is great. But it's not yet what I feel called to be or how I feel called to live in the world. And I bet I'm not the only one that feels this way. I wish I loved my neighbor and God more. And if you don't think that this is you, I'll remind you what our friend Dorothy, well, I say our friend, we don't really know her. Dorothy Day was a, a, a Catholic laywoman in the Catholic workers movement. She's a fabulous prophet of the, early, of the mid-20th century. She said, I really only love God as much as I love the person who I love the least. Uh oh, uh oh. Because <laughs> there's a lot of people way down on my love list. <laughs> and if that's the measure by which I love God, then I got a long way to go. And probably you do too. But if I'm honest, most of the time when I imagine the life that I am called to live or the person that I want to be as a disciple and follower of Jesus, it's really not any different than flipping through that catalog and circling all those imaginary toys and games and gifts. In the back of our sanctuary, there's that beautiful big stained glass window. We have a stained glass window here as well, and occasional stained glass or colored glass cubes on those back windows. We've got lots of symbols and reminders around here, but you probably know that since we're Protestants, that we don't have the same sort of rich tradition of iconography and imagery in our sanctuaries and worship spaces as our Roman Catholic brothers and sisters or as our Eastern Orthodox brothers and sisters. You walk into an Orthodox sanctuary or a Catholic sanctuary, especially in an old one, you're almost just inundated with images and colors and symbols, right? One of the oldest symbols, one of the earliest symbols that was developed in Christian iconography and Christian painting and imagery is called Christ Pantocrator. Everybody loves... No? Nobody knows Christ Pantocrator? Man! I don't know what you guys have been doing. (laughs) It's a Greek word. It comes from the Greek word, and it means Christ, ruler of rulers, or ruler of all. It is that portrait of Christ, the resurrected Christ, sitting over the whole of creation as both judge and savior. And he doesn't look angry or fierce. He's very calm and gentle, but a little stern as well. And a lot of times, especially in ancient churches, that is the predominant picture and portrayal of Christ. It is often in the domes, the center of the sanctuary, Christ looking down over his people. It's a beautiful and powerful image of the Savior whom we follow. And it's a reminder that the Christ story begins at Christmas. It doesn't stop there. We have this 
almost primal need, I think, sometimes at this time of year to be cozy and cuddly and quiet and comfortable and snuggled in our, we do all the warm, comfortable, fuzzy, warm things, don't we? I, as, soon as, as soon as the weather gets gray and rainy, when I walk through the grocery store, I have to be really careful or I will come home with 27 kinds of tea and so many cookies. We have this sort of almost like gravitational pull towards coziness this time of year. Understandably, nothing wrong with that. And I love walking into the sanctuary and into this space and seeing the greenery that reminds us of Christmas just around the corner. And I love Christmas Eve. I mean, not usually in the middle of it, but once it's over, it's amazing. It's so lovely. It's a little busy on the day of. But one of the great parts of being a pastor is that at the end of the last service, everybody's gone home and you get to turn the lights off in the church and lock the doors. And there's just this moment of silence and peace. I love that stuff. I love the story of the birth of Jesus in a stable a long time ago and far, far away. But the story of Christ doesn't stop here. And if we let Christ be frozen as a tiny infant stuck in a manger somewhere far, far away, there's not a lot of hope for Christ at work in the world today. The beauty and power of the story of Christmas and the baby who's born in Bethlehem is not that he stays a baby for the whole of his life. We celebrate the baby every year, of course. But we have to hear that story also in light of that baby becoming the Christ who judges the world, not to punish us, but to redeem us. Because otherwise, our hopes and wishes for a world that is different just are like flipping through that catalog when we were kids and imagining all the things that could be but powerless to make it happen. Our hopes for who we might be become just flipping through those pages of a catalog, imagining how much, how great it would be if we were different, that we were more loving and more kind and more generous and more gracious and more joyful but powerless to make it actually happen. We live with this strange sort of hope that is not just soft and gentle, but is fierce and challenging and disruptive and provocative. We live in the midst of a hope that Isaiah and the other prophets articulate that there will be a day when our swords and our spears are no longer instruments of war, but have become instruments of production and care for all people. When nations will not learn war against one another anymore, we live in a hope that that day is not just an imagined future, but is right around the corner. And we keep fighting for that world because we live in hope a fierce, real hope that bellies will all be filled one day. That no one sleeps on the streets one day. That all of God's people are free one day. We live with a strange kind of hope that the world as it is is not the way that God intends and it's not the way it always will be. When I was a kid flipping through those catalogs, I would circle everything that caught my eye and, and sounded like so much fun that I could imagine would be great. And I would show it to my family and go, look, this is the thing. I want all of these things, all of these things. And then I would passively wait. And not that passively. I would, I would annoy my parents by telling them over and over again what I wanted. But I didn't do anything to make it happen. I couldn't do anything to make that happen. 
And then when I didn't get everything in the catalog that I had circled, I just went, oh well, and moved on to the next year. And the next year, guess what? There was another catalog and so many more things that I wanted. But that is not the hope we are called to live in that just imagines the world and waits for it to be the way it could be, and we go, oh, well, maybe next year. The kind of hope that we are called to live is a hope that fights for the vision that God has for the world, that feeds hungry people, that houses houseless people, that works for peace and justice in our world. I want to live in that world. I want to be the kind of person who works and gives to the work of God in the world that makes it a more just, peaceful, love-filled place. We are called to live in hope. Not to just wish for things to be better, but to make hope real in what we say and what we do and how we give and how we live. It is Advent, brothers and sisters. We are waiting and watching and making ready for the Christ who is hope for our world. And that, my friends, is the good news. Thanks be to God. Amen. The season of Advent is an invitation to prepare to receive Christ, to make our lives and our world ready for his arrival. And the coming of Christ reminds us that God's work in the world is to bring justice and mercy to all people, because all people are God's children. The story of God's incarnation is the story of God's generosity. So in the name of the one for whom we wait and for whom we prepare, let us live generously. Let us live generously in what we give, but let us also live generously with love for all of God's children during this season of Advent. And we talk about giving We're not talking simply about financial giving. We're talking about giving of our love, giving of our time. Perhaps that's our listening ear or our back using it for labor or simply just being there for a friend. These are all forms of gifts and we have talents that should be given as well with a generous heart. So you can give to the work of this congregation online or by placing your offering in the box on the welcome table. But remember that that's only one form of giving and that there are lots of other ways that you can serve in this church and serve each other and also God's children who are not here and that would also appreciate your love. Thank you for your support of LOUMC's life and ministry. Let's stand for our closing song. Mighty to save.
remind me of all my fears and failures. Fill my life again. I give my life to follow everything I believe in. Friends, I invite you to receive these words of blessing and sending forth. May you go from here secure in the love of God, redeemed in Christ, sustained by God's Holy Spirit, that you might bear God's love into this world. Go in peace to love and serve God as you love and serve one another. Amen.